Hello everyone and welcome to our System Dynamics tutorial. This is the third in a series of videos that explain how to build simulation models using System Dynamics and the iThink modeling environment. Next to these videos, you can also find detailed explanations and demonstration models on our website www.business-prototyping.com. In this session, we'll show you how to quantify a stock and flow model using simple mathematical equations, using the stock and flow model from the last session as a basis. In that session, we developed the model on the map layer within iThink. In order to quantify the individual system parts, we now are going to move to the model layer. As you can see, the model looks the same on this layer, but each of the model elements now displays a question mark. A question mark on a model element signals that we haven't yet defined the equation which determines how exactly the model element depends on those model elements that influence it via incoming connectors, or which constant value it has if it does not have incoming connectors. In this session, you will learn how to create such equations. First, we're going to start with a stock. Let's take the open tasks. A stock's accumulation during a period of time is calculated by the initial value of it plus the inflow during that period minus the outflow of that same period. Our stock here has an outflow but it doesn't have an inflow. That's because we start the project with a predefined number of open tasks and assume that no more tasks will come up. So in this case the number of open tasks can only decrease or remain the same. Now we click on the stock to open its properties window. At the top of the window, we can see an option, Non-Negative, which is already selected. This option allows the stock to take only positive values. That means that when it will drain out, as will logically happen, since it has only an outflow connected on it, its state value will never go below zero. We prefer not to use this option. We would rather add our own logic to the model that ensures the stock does not become negative. This way, we can ensure that the model's behavior is completely transparent to us. Below that option, we can see another field, which is called Equation. In our base scenario, we assume that the project initially has 100 open tasks. So we select the box under Open Tasks and enter 100. At the top of the window, we can see an option, Non-Negative, which is already selected. This option allows the stock to take only positive values. That means that when it will drain out, as will logically happen since it has only an outflow connected on it, its state value will never go below zero. We prefer not to use this option. We would rather add our own logic to the model that ensures the stock does not become negative. This way, we can ensure that the model's behavior is completely transparent to us. Below that option, we can see another field, which is called Equation. In our base scenario, we assume that the project initially has 100 open tasks. So we select the box under Open Tasks and enter 100. As you can see, there's also an option to define what kind of units are included in this stock. This is useful for more sophisticated models, where the rule of unit consistency could be violated. This is a simple rule in order to avoid mixing apples with oranges in the same stock. In our experience, it's sensible to use this feature in more complex models, but we will not do so now for the sake of simplicity. Let's move on to the closed tasks. We select the stock and type 0 in the equations box. This simply means that we assume that no tasks have been completed at the beginning of the project. We also assume that we have only one employee working on these tasks. So we click on Staff and type 1 into the Equations box. Please note that the question marks disappear every time we add an equation to a model element. Still, we have a number of question marks in the model, so let's continue to fill in the missing parameters. I will select a converter now, Effort per Task. The window that comes up when clicking on a converter is slightly different from the one of a stock. It contains more options than a stock or flow. 
We will discuss and use these later on. When it comes to simulating a model, you need to make sure that the model's behavior is consistent with your own mental model at all times. To make this task easier, it's best to choose settings that make it easy to perform the necessary calculations in our head. So here, we initially assume that the effort it takes to complete a task is equal to one day. Note that this converter has to be a constant because it does not have any incoming connectors. So now let's move to the factor productivity. As we can see on the diagram, there's a connector leading from schedule pressure to productivity. That means that the equation of productivity must include schedule pressure since the latter influences the former. I think informs us about this by listing the required inputs which are shown on the properties window. We chose the only one that appears there, schedule pressure, and I think automatically sends it into the equation. As it stands, productivity is defined to be equal to schedule pressure, but our discussion in the introductory tutorial shows that the relationship between the two is actually more complex. Next, we're going to put a graphical function to define how productivity increases regarding to schedule pressure. We select the second tab at the bottom of the properties window with the graph symbol on it and activate the graphical function. Now we have two options. We can either draw the function by ourselves or input data and let the software draw it. Let's go for the second option, but before doing so, we will type the value scale for these two variables on the graph. So 0 to 1.25 for productivity and 0 to 2.5 for schedule pressure. Then we move to the points tab. Next, we will fill the productivities column. The data we filled in in the table produce an S-shaped graph. This shows that productivity increases rapidly in the beginning, but after a while, the increase rate slows down and finally balances when it reaches its limits. The information we are using is just a best guess, but experience and research show that the graph matches reality very well. Note that it's important that a schedule pressure of 1 also produces a productivity of 1. Now, I will go back to define the rate of the only flow that exists in this model, the completion rate. If you take a little time to reflect, you will realize that the completion rate can be calculated at any time as the number of staff working on the project multiplied with the average productivity and then divided by the effort each task requires. So I just type this as an equation. But what will happen when the open tasks stock runs out of tasks or has fewer than the completion rate asks for? Clearly, the number of open tasks cannot be negative, so we need to ensure that the outflow from the open tasks shuts down to zero as soon as the number of tasks equals zero. To achieve this, I use the min function from the list of built-in functions and include the existing equation and the open tasks. I separate them with a comma. Now, every time the flow rate is calculated, the completion rate is compared to the number of remaining tasks. The smaller value of the two is selected as the flow rate. This ensures that the number of tasks flowing from the stock of open tasks can never be higher than the number of remaining open tasks, and thus the stock can never become negative. The next question mark that we're going to deal with is the one on the schedule pressure. This is the trickiest part of the quantification process because we need a slightly more sophisticated equation here. As you can see on the required inputs list, there are four inputs that affect the schedule pressure and these need to be combined in a way that makes sense. Let's take a little time to think about schedule pressure. Essentially, 
schedule pressure compares the remaining workload with the remaining work capacity. If the workload is higher than the work capacity, then the schedule pressure is high, otherwise it's low. At any time, the project's remaining workload is represented by the number of remaining open tasks multiplied with the effort each task requires to be completed. The project's work capacity is calculated as the number of staff available multiplied with the remaining time. Let's make this explicit in the model by rearranging the stock and flow diagram. Now, we can define the equation for schedule pressure as workload divided by work capacity. It seems fine from a logical point of view, but if we put on our mathematic glasses and check it again, we will see a regulation that could be violated. I'm talking about the denominator of the fraction. At the end of the project, the work capacity will be zero because the remaining time is zero. To ensure this does not happen, we use the max function to ensure the denominator is never zero. Let's do so. Another thing that we have to take care of is the value range of schedule pressure. As you might remember, before typing in data for the function in the productivity converter's properties, we defined the schedule pressure takes values from zero to 2.5. The range is arbitrary, and is chosen to be large enough to ensure that it's not reached in practical situations. So we have to make sure that schedule pressure generates values inside that range. To do so, I will put a min function to our existing equation and include the value 2.5 after a comma. We have to be careful when writing equations. If there are any typos, the iThink software will come up with an exclamation mark on the equations box, informing us that something went wrong. Even better than that, it informs us what could be wrong, so we easily find it and correct it. Moving down to the remaining time, things become easier. The remaining time is defined as the difference between deadline and current time. We click both of them in the list with the required inputs and add a minus between them to calculate the difference. I will put 100 on the deadline's converter. It means we have 100 time periods till the deadline. For the last converter, current date, I will select the function time, which gives us the current time period of the simulation at each step. I didn't say anything about our ghost, and this is not because it's invisible. As we explained in session two, this is just a shortcut of another converter, thus we've defined its equation already. That's it. All question marks are gone, and we're ready to run a simulation. We'll do that in our next session, where we'll design an interface to interact with the model and play with various scenarios. Goodbye, and thank you for watching.